In 1940, the immense popularity of the Three Stooges was deemed such a potential threat to the credibility of the Third Reich that Adolf Hitler added them to his personal death list. What roused the Führer's ire was a Stooges two reeler called, You Nasty Spy, a ruthless send-up of Hitler, and his fascist regime released nine months before Chaplin's The Great Dictator, a full year before America, still firmly isolationist, entered World War II, and produced in direct defiance of both the censorious Hayes Code, and the prevailing mood in Hollywood which was, with overseas markets already in jeopardy, to play nice, and not rock the Nazi boat. The image of the Three Stooges as fearless anti-fascist crusaders, willing to put their livelihoods and their lives on the line in the noble cause of liberty, will come as a shock to anyone who thinks of them, if they think of them at all, as a fifth-rate Marx Brothers knockoff whose principal contribution to the art of comedy was the twin-fingered eye poke. The bookkeeper! Go, burn the books! Why burn the books? There are too many bookmakers. The bookies are overrunning the country. Those are my orders. Hail, hail, hailstone! And, to be honest, that would include most of the non-North American population of the planet, and anyone in possession of a vagina. What will also come as a surprise to non-Stooge fans, and, as with Marmite and s and m porn, there is no middle ground when it comes to Stooge fandom, is not only that they were once sufficiently popular to get Hitler's dander up, but that said popularity has not waned one iota in the intervening decades. In fact, it's safe to say, that the Three Stooges, 35 years after the last remaining original Stooge, Mo Howard gouged his last cornea, are more celebrated today than they were at the zenith of their prolonged, checkerboard career. <clears throat> Mo, Larry, and Curly, the classic Stooge lineup, are stitched into the cultural fabric of America, in a way that few entertainers are, rivaling Marilyn and Elvis for kitsch cult supremacy. They are, it's claimed, with some justification, the most popular comedy team in history, appearing in almost 200 shorts and feature films from the early 1930s to the early 1970s, hosting their own TV show, and making countless stage and personal appearances. Without going into the somewhat convoluted prehistory of the Stooges, it's sufficient to say that the three Horowitz brothers, Moses, Jerome, and Samuel, better known by their stage names as Mo, Curly, and Shem Howard, were nice, blue-collar Jewish boys from Brooklyn, born without an ounce of theatrical blood in their veins. Nevertheless, at an early age, and not unusually for working-class Jews around the turn of the century, both Mo and Shem decided on a career in show business. The pair had moderate success in a variety of burlesque shows, before teaming up for the first time in 1916, to perform a blackface routine. They continued this until 1922, when they encountered an old friend from their Brooklyn days, comedian Ted Healy, then a rapidly rising star in vaudeville. Healy recruited them to be his sidekicks, and when Philadelphia musician and comedian Larry Fine was brought into the act, the Three Stooges were born. As the Stooges stock continues to grow, Ted Healy has become an increasingly marginalized figure, remembered only for his poor treatment of his co-stars who, history would have it, and have it incorrectly, outshone him from the get-go, and for the excessive drinking and wildly erratic behavior that lead to his violent death. Applauded and applauded, until he sat down. Now we're gonna do the same act, we're gonna rehearse it now. You remember the old routine? Yeah, I know, Mike. About the white horse, the white horse. Yeah. 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 In fact, Healy was an enormously successful entertainer, one of the biggest stars of his era, who has been cited as a formative influence by such comedy legends as Red Skelton, Milton Berle, and Bob Hope. As the young Stooges' mentor, he practically invented the style of brutal slapstick that has made them legends, and if, along the way, he stiffed them out of their fair share of the proceeds, his pivotal role in their history deserves to be recognized. That said, there is no doubt that Healy was a terrible boss, not only tight with a buck, but an abusive, volatile drum to boot. In 1930, Ted Healy and his Stooges, they were never billed as the Three Stooges while they worked for Healy, appeared in the Fox Studios feature film, Soup to Nuts. It was not a hit. Healy's act, which relied heavily on ad-libs and improvisation, never transferred successfully to film, neither was he exactly movie star material, with a bulbous bud face and big boozer's nose. The Stooges, on the other hand, impressed the Fox brass, and they were offered a contract without Healy. Furious, Healy immediately put the kibosh on this by claiming the Stooges were his employees. The offer was duly rescinded. When Larry, Mo, and Shemp got word of this, they decided to cut Healy loose anyway and struck out on their own. True to form, Healy was incensed, forbidding them to use any of their old routines, which he considered his own copyrighted material, even threatening to bomb theaters if the Stooges dared to play them. In desperation, Healy made a failed attempt to salvage his act by hiring replacement Stooges. Amazingly, in 1932, with Mo, now the group's business manager, Healy, and his Stooges settled their differences and began working together again. It proved anything but a joyful reunion. Healy's Jekyll and Hyde personality, exacerbated by his increasingly heavy drinking, so terrified the notoriously skittish Shemp that he left the act to go solo, and was soon making comedy shorts for Vitaphone, back in Brooklyn. 
This left the Stooges a man down. Shemp's proposed solution was that Moe's baby brother, Jerry, filled the gap. Healy was scathing. With all the foresight and perception that comes with drinking wild turkey for breakfast, he took one look at the future Curly Howard, the most beloved of all the Stooges, and dismissed him as not funny. Do you solemnly swear to tell us who told you that other than the truth? Are you trying to give me the double talk? Do you solemnly swear to tell us who told you that other than the truth? Admittedly, Jerry did not much resemble his iconic alter ego at that point, sporting long red hair and a handlebar mustache. And, it must be said, neither Moe nor Larry had any confidence in Jerry's comic abilities either. Moe stated flatly to Shemp that Jerry had no talent whatsoever. That changed abruptly when, at Shemp's urging, Jerry ran on stage in the middle of a Stooges routine, sporting a freshly shaved head, wearing a bathing suit, and carrying a tiny bucket of water. This earned him a huge laugh from the crowd, vaudeville audiences were obviously a pushover, and one of the most gifted comic performers of the 20th century had officially arrived. Talk so the jury can understand. Is everybody dumb? Say, Judgy, if you let me, my partner, and Gailey kinda act it out for you, we'll show you just what happened. With Curly on board, Ted Healy and his Stooges signed a one-year contract with MGM to make five shorts and a couple of full-length features, none of which proved remarkable. The contract was not renewed, and in 1934, Healy and his Stooges finally went their separate ways. Ted Healy, whose career from this point on, although still highly successful, fades from the history books, could fairly be described as his own worst enemy. Not only was he prone to violent drunken rages, but he was also apt to do some very dumb things indeed. Aside from insulting Charles Lucky Luciano's Italian heritage, and attempting as a gag, to knock off one of Al Capone's private safes, perhaps the dumbest thing he ever did was up in comic actress Thelma Todd, while she was still married to mobster Pasquale Pat De Sicco, Luciano's eyes and ears in Tinseltown, and confidant of the Hollywood high and mighty. When Todd turned up dead in 1935, real the suicide but almost certainly De Sicco's work, a spook Healy swore off actresses for good, and took up with a beautiful UCLA student named Betty Hickman, whom he later married. Unfortunately, he neglected to swear off getting drunk and acting like a perk in public, and three years after Todd's death, while out celebrating the birth of his first child, he ran into De Sicco again. Already several sheets to the wind when he arrived at the Trocadero on the Sunset Strip, Healy lost no time in mixing things up with another famously belligerent drunk, character actor Wallace Beery, who was drinking at the bar with De Sicco. Healy suggested they take things outside. They duly did, and Beery and De Sicco proceeded to beat Healy to a pulp. The beating was so savage, in fact, that the following day Healy fell into a coma and died. There was little, or no serious investigation into Healy's death, and a farcical autopsy, performed after his body had been embalmed, concluded that he had died of acute alcoholism, noting that his organs were soaked in alcohol as of course, they would have been, having just been embalmed. When his wife Betty, by then an MGM contract player, complained to the press about the lack of interest in Healy's death, she was summarily fired by the studio, and never worked in Hollywood again. At the time of Healy's death, the Three Stooges had been under contract to the monstrous Harry Combs Columbia Pictures for three years. They were on the brink of their greatest success, and had honed their act into the classic Stooge mode that defines them to this day. By this point, with almost 30 shorts and five features for Columbia under their belts, the individual Stooge personalities were fully formed, and the group dynamic, on which the Stooges' comedy rested as heavily as the brutality in the pie fights, had emerged. So we'll save you macaroni. <laughs> Hiya, doctor. The internal mechanism of the Three Stooges is deceptively simple. It's based on the premise that all of them are stupid, but some are more stupid than others. Mo, with his gravelly voice, a permanent scowl and menacing helmet of bowl cut hair, was the leader, invariably the underboss and treated with overseeing, whatever hopelessly doomed endeavor the Stooges found themselves pursuing, and whatever it was, you can bet it involved heavy objects, and the potential for maximum mayhem. Plumbing, not surprisingly, was a favorite stooge profession. Oh! What's the idea? Always hitting Stop arguing and it's off, ain't it? <laughs> this one's locked too. What do we do now? Well, you break the arm off about there. Curly, his hulking frame bursting out of a too small suit, was the irredeemably incompetent man-child, the knucklehead's knucklehead and recipient of most of Moe's abuse, a litany of punches, slaps, and smacks, bonks on the head, and quintessential Moe, the twin prong poke in the eye. Mo actually had his brother Shemp to thank for his signature move. Once, during a card game, Shemp became so convinced that Larry was cheating him, he leaped up and poked him in both eyes. Mo made a note of it and duly incorporated it into the act. Larry, too often underestimated, was the all-important bridge between Mo's authoritarian bully and Curly's baby-faced clown. An easygoing simpleton, Larry was the essential, non-threatening intermediary, and he brought a special genius to the role. Of course, he also got hit in the head with a wrench now and then too. 
As early as 1942, the life of a stooge had begun to take its toll on Curly. Playing a human punch bag, day in day out, for years, enduring constant blows to the head, most of which, according to Mo Howard, was every bit as real as they looked. Brought on a series of minor cerebral hemorrhages that slowed him down to the point that he was unable to make personal appearances. Shemp, now under contract to Columbia himself, was brought in to replace Curly in live performances. Curly's doctors insisted that he also take time off from his punishing filming schedule. Cohen flatly refused to give Curly leave of absence, and it was not long before his declining health became evident on screen. There's no doubt that Curly's hard partying lifestyle contributed to his health problems. He was a massive drinker, and Pin had appearances to the contrary, a voracious womanizer. But neither is there any disputing that Harry Cohen forced him to keep working while he was clearly seriously ill, exacerbating his condition, until later in 1945, the inevitable happened, and Curly, age 42, suffered his first major stroke. This should have signaled, at the very least, an extended period of rest and recuperation. Yet, incredibly, he was back at work within a month, despite physical impairments that rendered his performances so sluggish and lackluster, they're painful to watch. I was putting in, eh? Come on! <laughs> Why, I love it's murder. But it was a losing battle, and in 1946, between takes on the short half wits holiday, a remake of the 1935 Turieller, Hoi Palloi, Curly suffered a massive paralyzing stroke. His days as a stooge were over, his career and his health wrecked by dedication to the ungentle art of slapstick, and by Harry Cohn's gross callousness. Callousness compounded with stupidity since his treatment of Curly had cost him one of his studio's most valuable assets. Now listen, mister, listen. I can explain the whole thing. Sight me! You stay out of this. Oh. And you too. I didn't say nothing. Well, that was in case you do. In retrospect, the solution seems obvious. But the decision to bring Shemp back into the act was not that simple. First of all, since advocating his stoogedom in 1932, Shemp had forged a successful career as a solo performer, and he was reluctant to sacrifice all that he'd achieved on his own to be reabsorbed into a team he'd opted out of 14 years previously. Secondly, he was now over 50, a dedicated family man, and did not relish the prospect of lengthy road trips, or the Stooges' arduous schedule of personal appearances. Thirdly, there was the prospect of his living in Curly's substantial shadow, a very real concern, albeit an ironic one, given Curly had originally replaced, and comprehensively eclipsed him. Reluctantly, he signed on, but only, he insisted, until a permanent replacement for Curly could be found. In the end, Shemp remained a Stooge until his dying day. The team's personal life was rocked in 1952, when Curly died. Three years later Shem followed him, dead from a heart attack at 60. By rights, this should have been the end of the road. But, in a supremely ironic twist of fate, the Stooges were actually on the brink of a major comeback. In 1958, Columbia offered a package of 78 Curly-era shorts for TV broadcast. Hello! 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 Picked up by a number of networks across the United States, they were an instant hit, particularly with children, and soon all 190 Stooge shorts were in circulation and drawing huge audiences. Suddenly the Stooges were in big demand, and Mo and Larry once again revived the act with Joe Curly Joe Dorita, stepping into the breach. In January 1970, Larry Fine suffered a debilitating stroke, ending his career. Longtime Stooge co-star Emil Sicca was contracted to replace him, but no footage was ever shot with Sicca as a Stooge. In December 1974, Larry suffered another stroke, and the following month, he died at the age of 72. With near unbelievable fortitude, Mo vowed the Stooges would soldier on, approaching veteran, Ted Healy era Stooge, Paul Mousy Garner. Tragically, while negotiating a number of movie projects, Mo was diagnosed with terminal lung cancer. He died on May 4, 1975. However you feel about the Stooges, such devotion is not born from an eye poke alone, two-fingered, or otherwise. Oh, you want a pop? Yeah. Oh.